Welcome to our weekly WORM webinar. This is the seventh one in our series of eight. My name is Susan Shaney and I'm the Sheep and Goat Specialist with the University of Maryland. These webinars are sponsored by my university, also Fort Valley State University, Dr. Nikki Whitley, who is our presenter today, Virginia State University, Dr. Dahlia O'Brien, and Dr. Kwame Matthews at Delaware State University. Today's presentation is, what do you do when warming is not enough? Our presenter is Dr. Nikki Whitley. Dr. Whitley is a small ruminant specialist and animal scientist at Fort Valley State University in Georgia. Dr. Whitley used to be at North Carolina A&T University and used to be at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. So I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Whitley. So a brief overview of what we're dealing with. When we look at the major work for sheep and goats, we're mostly talking about internal parasites. There are others uh, that we'll talk about depending on the weather um, and the season and geographic location that are important parasites for our small ruminants, sheep, goats, and camelids. But the main one that we are all aware of is Homuncus contortus or the barber pole worm. And the barber pole worm we know is resistant to drugs from all three classes. And those three classes being what I call the dissolve class, the ectin class. Those two classes end in either dissolve or ectin and then the other class. There'll be more information, more detailed information about internal parasites and managing internal parasites in some online FAMACHA workshops including those that will be available at www.wormx.info. So when we look at management, again, this is going to be a brief overview of the things that we do, including deworming, that are going to be part of an integrated parasite management program. And those are going to include pasture management, animal management, dewormer management, and then possibly some others. And there's more information on some of these topics, specific topics, such as pasture management, in one of these weekly worm webinars at this link here, the wormx.info webinar slash videos link. We're going to start with pasture management. So again, there's going to be way more detail provided in the FAMACHA and Integrated Parasite Management Workshop. So we won't go over this in detail, but basically we want to rest the pastures, rotate pastures. We want to manage the height of the pastures so that the animals are not as likely to get worms. We can use annuals or make cleaner pastures through burning dormant pastures, using new pastures, using browse. We can help manage parasites with the use of alternative forages. We can use multi-species grazing. We can manage our stocking rates, which is going to be a part of managing that forage height. It's best to use overall animal weights as more like animal units for managing stocking rates, but we generally tell people start at three to five adults per acre of good pasture when you're looking at stocking rates for parasite management. Obviously, there are issues with nutritional management when your forage gets too mature or too tall, so we want to consider that as well. And it's possible to look at a product such as Bioworma, which has been shown to reduce pasture worm contamination by reducing the larvae that get out of that manure pat. And again, we do have a webinar on Bioworma that is available at that webinar website at wormx.info. When we look at animal management, one of the key pieces that we can do that's very quick as far as helping to manage parasites is just to keep that animal in a good nutritional status. So provide appropriate energy and protein levels. Some research has indicated that even providing higher protein or 30% over their maintenance requirements is beneficial for parasite control. And when we look at that and we look at 
the nutritional value of our forages, there may be times when we need to consider supplementation on pasture. We want to provide good quality loose minerals to help support immune function for sheep and goats. So made for your animal species. So a mineral made for sheep. If you have sheep, one made for goats. If you have goats, we want to keep them in good body condition score. Body condition is usually scored on a scale of one to five and we want to keep those between a two and a four with two being the the end that is the lowest and usually found more often in animals that, for example, have just weaned large litters. We want to focus our efforts of animal management for parasite on those that are most susceptible, those that are young from around weaning to one year of age, and then those in late pregnancy and early lactation because those are the ones that are going to be, again, more susceptible to worms. And then we want to look at genetic selection. So the periparturin egg rise, that incidence of high fecal egg counts around late pregnancy and lactation was covered in an earlier webinar by Susan Shanian, and that one is available. Then we have genetic selection covered by Dr. O'Brien in the series. When we look at dewormer management, obviously some of the newer protocols that have been recommended include using combination dewormers, so using more than one dewormer class, but given only to those that need it. We recommend using targeted select treatment, using FAMACHA or five point check to determine which ones to treat. And you can learn more about that again during the FAMACHA training. We want to do that to help maintain refugia. We want to make sure we give our drugs correctly. So we want to use the right dose by weight. So we want a good estimate of weight by weighing them preferably. We want to give our drugs orally over the tongue at the back of the mouth. And we want to make sure we're using the correct dose for goats, which is generally higher than that for sheep, one and a half to two times the labeled dose. And there is at wormx.info a deworming chart for sheep and goats. We want to follow storage directions for dewormers and we want to monitor expiration dates. And then there are considerations of using copper oxide wire particles as a dewormer. Again, more information will be provided in a specific training workshop. If animals do get to a FAMACHA 4 or 5 and they're very symptomatic, they have diarrhea, rough hair coat, they're probably off feed, um, and they may have lost a lot of weight, then we want to take some actions. And this is where we're starting to talk about what do we do if deworming is not enough. Well, we do want to deworm. We want to deworm correctly. We want to use an effective deworming protocol. So we want to use a, a combination of the drugs that are going to work on our farm. However, we do want to make sure that if the animal is not eating, we may want to use a less harsh dewormer. We don't definitely do not want to use porons orally because that is very hard on the liver. And the Levamisol label says to see a vet before using in severely debilitated or very sick animals. So supporting the liver when you're given chemical dewormers is important because the liver is going to be clearing the chemicals from the body helping to metabolize those chemicals. So we want to make sure that we get them on feed as soon as possible, give them some supplements and we'll, we'll talk about that. We want to look at fecal egg counts. The reason why we do that is to make sure that we're monitoring for reduction. So make sure our treatments were effective. We can also use that to check for coccidia because coccidia can also cause anemia in sheep and goats. And so if we got them up for anemia or for diarrhea, because 
coccidia also causes diarrhea, then we want to make sure that our deworming is helping solve the problem, which it won't if it's coccidia. Coccidia requires a different treatment. We want to try to prevent reinfection. So if the animal is not too flighty or too afraid of people, it's beneficial to move them inside on in a dry lot, somewhere where they're not going to eat off the ground and get reinfected. Obviously, if the animal is really afraid of people, sometimes that is very stressful for them and we want to keep stress as low as possible. Especially if they're not used to being alone, you want to have another animal with them to provide them company and keep them from being chronically stressed. If an animal is not used to people, you may leave them in the pen where they're at, in the pasture where they're at, if they're easily accessible. And when they gather some strength, then move them to a different pen or pasture. Obviously, if that animal is down, you would have to do more than just monitor them. You would have to take care of them and give them supportive therapy like we're going to talk about in a few minutes. We want to monitor the FAMACHA score. It usually takes two to three weeks to see a full score change in FAMACHA. So don't panic if after two or three days you don't see improvements, although I have heard from producers using some anecdotal supplementation that indicate changes in a week or less, but that hasn't been proven in research. We want to provide high quality nutrition or feed. So we talked about higher protein being able, helping the animal to fight off parasites. It also helps them to recover from parasitism. So as the animal loses blood, they're losing protein. As they're not eating, they're not getting protein. They're breaking down their body's proteins to help with immune function to fight off those parasites. So providing a higher protein diet is very important when you look at recovering from parasitism as well as fighting off parasites. Legumes, legume forages like alfalfa, cowpea, peanut, um, to some extent, um, Cerecia lespedeza, they have high protein levels. You could also feed a commercial feed that has higher protein levels or mix your own feed with higher protein levels. However, if that animal is not used to being fed a commercial feed or a grain-based feed, you want to make those changes in their diet very slowly because you don't want to cause them any other problems, any gastrointestinal problems, any enterotoxemia or overeating disease issues while you're trying to help them recover from parasitism. You can do what we call cut and carry. So we see that this sheep is down and there looks like grass forage that's been placed in front of that animal so that she has easy access to it. I tell people to try to identify the animal's favorites. I had some people with a, a down goat and she just absolutely adored oak leaves or something. I don't remember. And they, so they would bring her her favorite leaves. Uh, make sure you're not bringing them anything toxic, of course, nothing anti-nutritional, but bring them their favorites. We want to do what we can to make sure they get back on feed and keep it close to them. As in this picture, it, obviously, if they have to get up to eat, they're using energy and some of them won't. I mean, that may be why we have them in the situation that we have them in, in a pen, because they're, they're down and they're not getting up to graze to eat or to drink. We want to make sure we keep them in a sternal position. So a position a little bit like this you here so that they don't lay out flat. Laying out flat is, is not good for ruminants. We want to try to keep them in a sternal position. And to do that, you can, if they can't keep themselves upright themselves, you can prop them against the fence, in the wall of a barn, against straw bales, whatever you have to help keep that animal more in that sternal position. And as they get better 
if we can encourage them to, to move around again as they gain energy and strength. Obviously, we don't want to stress out animals that are still in a weakened state. If they're not eating, we want to provide some nutritional support. So we can drench them with products such as propylene glycol, which is used as a ketosis treatment. And the, the treatment for ketosis and that can be used in this instance is 60 cc's twice a day. However, you do not want to give it if the animal is not really off feed. So it can actually reduce intake and can cause rumen dysfunction if the animal is not really off feed and we don't want to give it long term. We can use nutrient drenches and there are several that you can purchase and no endorsement of any specific trade name is intended but examples include nutrient drenches. You can make your homemade drenches. There's some actual anecdotal evidence of a lot of people who indicate that giving dark beer will help get animals back on feed and help them feel better. And it is a treatment that Virginia State University has used for ketosis mixed with an egg for that added protein. And egg also has high choline, which supports liver function. So it may be beneficial as well. You can use Cairo syrup or molasses for a quick energy source, but we do want to be careful of overdoing, especially these quick energy sources, especially if the animal is not used to a, a grain-based feed or carbohydrate-based feed. You can kick them into acidosis, which then cause enterotoxemia or overeating disease. So we want to make sure we're careful when we're using those with animals that are not used to it. And then we can consider adding a protein source, like a powdered protein that will help to keep down that, that quick energy acidosis problem or could and add protein, which is what we want to do. To help balance out gut function, we can try some yogurt that has live cultures that serve as pre and probiotics. We could use some probiotic pastes or other types of probiotics. And if you're worried or concerned about acidosis or stomach upset, you can give bicarbonate or baking soda mixed in, mixed in with water and, and drench them with that or leave it out for them to be able to lick as they need. You can make sure that you try to stop that diarrhea if they have diarrhea because that's going to help make them get dehydrated. And you can do that using products such as kale and pectin, Pepto-Bismol, or other similar products that don't treat anything. So they don't cure the diarrhea. They stop it and they stop it temporarily. It takes quite a bit of this. I think when we use it to be able to collect fecal egg counts for studies, we give 20 to 30 cc's minimum for a 50 pound animal. So it does take quite a bit. Cerisa lespedeza has been shown to dry up fecals to, to help firm up that fecal matter. So make them have more like pellets and make the pellets even drier. So possibility to use the Cerisa lespedeza, which has the added benefit of helping to control coccidia and also to help control parasites. Once we stop that diarrhea, it's going to help us to keep that animal hydrated. We want to make sure that they have water and preferably with electrolytes if they'll drink it. If it makes them stop drinking the water, we don't want to include the electrolytes, but we want to have it nearby. So with this animal, I would put it right where they could just lift their head and drink. So if it has to be a smaller bucket or a smaller container so that they can reach over, but so they don't have to exert a lot of effort to be able to drink. It's super important to, to have water. If they're not drinking, we can drench them with a drench gun. 
we can tube them. If the animal is a, a large animal, we may need to tube them because they need a half to one gallon a day of water or fluids minimum. So when we look at that, if you look at the number of cc's you would have to give for just one quart with four quarts in a gallon, that's a lot if we have to give them everything that they're gonna have to intake. So obviously, especially with larger animals that need a 100, uh, 100 pound animal a gallon a day, you may have to end up tubing them but dehydration um, is very hard on the kidneys. They can, they can be in deep trouble if we let them stay dehydrated. If they get to a critical situation as far as dehydration, definitely call your vet, get some injectable lactated ringers or um, sterile saline solution that is used for in either IVs or subcutaneous injection under their skin so that you can get them rehydrated. We have some research that says iron is beneficial. So iron as a supplemental treatment for recovery from parasites. When we look at injected iron, they used 25 milligrams per kilogram, which is about 11.4 milligrams per pound of body weight. And how many cc's that is depends on what your concentration of iron is in, your, in the product you're injecting. But they injected on day zero and seven. So when they looked at that, they found that they had increased red blood cell formation as early as day seven, which is rare. So I believe these animals were artificially made anemic, and so they were pretty anemic. But so at day seven, 14, and 21 after treatment, they had increased erythropoiesis. So there is proof that iron is beneficial in parasitized or anemic lambs. Another study used iron dextran, which is basically the same thing that you can get for giving baby pigs iron shots. And so commonly available iron dextran at 20 milligrams per kilogram, which is nine milligrams per pound of body weight. And they artificially infected them with barber pole and then gave their injections every seven days to support red blood cell function or formation. And the lambs did have improved red blood cell counts and improved hematocrit and hemoglobin concentration. So there is proof that iron is beneficial. However, you can give too much. So you want to make sure that you are talking to a veterinarian or a very experienced person and make sure you don't have high levels of iron in your water or other sources so that you know exactly what that animal is getting. There's some research as well for vitamin B12. So vitamin B12 and, and folate or B9 are both important for red blood cell formation. And in New Zealand, there was a research study that showed that chicory not only reduced fecal egg count in wild deer, but also resulted in high copper, which is important for immune function and fighting off parasites, as well as B12. A lot of people swear by injectable B12 giving, given to help animals recover from parasitism, especially anemia. You can get vitamin B12 injectable but that's prescription only so you have to go through your vet or you can use a fortified vitamin b complex now the fortified vitamin b complex which is available over the counter has much lower levels of b12 it's like 10 times less than the injectable version but it does have other b vitamins including thiamine which has this product actually has five times less thiamine than the prescription but it is available over the counter and it can be used and is commonly used because often we're treating our animals 
because we don't have a veterinarian available in our area, that kind of thing. You can also, if you don't want to give injections, so these were injectable products I'm talking about, but you can get oral supplements, vitamin B12, the B vitamins are water soluble, and you can also get oral iron supplements if you didn't want to give shots. Obviously, they don't get as much as quickly or even as much in general with oral supplementation as they do with injectable. There's some other minerals that are needed for building red blood cells and that in deficiency situations have been seen to cause problems with anemia. And so in cobalt deficiency, you can see anemia. Early work has shown that some cobalt supplementation helped with that. Maybe through the fact that cobalt is used to make vitamin B12, and then B12 is super important for, for building our blood. Selenium deficiency had also, in a selenium deficient area, selenium supplementation also helped improve signs of anemia. And copper and zinc deficiencies can also cause anemia. So we want to make sure we're not result, uh, causing nutritional deficiencies that would result in anemia. We don't want to just willy-nilly, though, be given injectable or oral supplementation of minerals because you can overdose them. You don't want to do that. So you do want to work uh, with a veterinarian or a knowledgeable extension personnel or producer with experience in this area. You can give oral multivitamin or and mineral supplements and we have several producers that swear by Red Cell. Red Cell has a bunch of different vitamins and minerals in it including the ones I've already mentioned plus more. Again, some of the producers that have sworn by it have used different doses. I had a sheep producer who swore that if she gave red cell at the labeled dose, which I think is an ounce, which is around 30 cc's, at worming and then three days later, that the animals would recover. And if she didn't, then the animals would not recover. So we did a study using less symptomatically parasitized animals, meaning that she, when she would administer it, it was to not just animals with a FAMACHA 4 or 5, but maybe they were already down or they were really weak. Obviously, at the university level, we can't allow animals to get that sick before we treat them. So though they had pack cell volumes indicative of parasites, and fecal egg counts indicative of parasites. We couldn't let them get to a point that mimicked what she was seeing. And we only used one dose or 30 cc's at deworming. So we did not see differences, but we might have under different circumstances. And I say that because anecdotally, and again, we get back to anecdotally, it's not proven, but we had a couple of lambs on our first study that were very weak when we got them up to see if they needed to be dewormed to see if they could be on the study. And they were FAMACHA four and a half for one and a five for the other. They both basically went down when we were trying to get them up. So I had to carry them in the back of the truck up to the working chute. We dewormed them and gave them red cell. And three days later, they had what visually seemed like a higher FAMACHA score, which is supposedly not possible. So anecdotally, again, producers will use it. There are some that use it at a much lower level, but more consistent, consistently, like maybe just use four or five cc's, but give it every day or every other day for a week or so. But 
again, this does contain vitamins and minerals, and you should work with your vet, consult a vet, or talk to somebody that knows what levels of minerals and issues you may have on your farm. One producer indicated that her vet suggested using vitamin K. Vitamin K causes blood clotting, so it's possible that if you have blood loss due to homunculus contortus or coccidia damage in the small intestine that vitamin K may be beneficial. We have some colleagues that were vets in India who recommended liver tonics before deworming or with deworming and those will commonly contain choline which has some nutritional sources like meats and eggs, milk thistle extract, and some other components including vitamins and minerals. That hasn't really been common in the US, but our colleagues from India recommend it. Along with some of these treatments that we've mentioned, some treatments that veterinarian, veterinarians can give us, along with those supplemental treatments already mentioned and IVs for dehydration include blood transfusion. So the normal packed cell volume or percentage of packed red blood cells in a blood sample for sheep is 27 to 45% and for a goat is 22 to 38%. We had a goat it was in a pen study that honestly showed very few signs of parasitism until one day it was hiding in the hay feeder from the other goats. So I, when I pulled him out, I noticed that he was, he was still fighting me, but I noticed that he was weaker than normal. So I looked at his eyes, he was a Famacha 5. Um, his hematocrit or was packed cell volume was around 8%. And so our vet tech center actually here on campus actually did a blood transfusion and the animal did live. So they can have reactions because they do have blood types, but it's, it's very rare for the first transfusion but because it's more likely to happen in the second, they usually will only do that transfusion once. So overall, what you've probably learned today, what you may have already known, is that we know deworming is generally not enough. It's not enough for parasite management. We can't rely just on our dewormers, our deworming protocols. We need to look at animal management, nutritional management, deworming management, all of those things to help manage parasites and small ruminants. And critically important is providing adequate nutrition and mineral supplementation, preferably, preferably loose minerals that are made specifically for your species, maybe even for your area of the, of the world. And if you can't do loose minerals or you prefer to know that the animals are getting the vitamins and minerals, there are vitamin and mineral packs that you can add to your own feed stuffs to mix in to balance your own rations, or you can buy complete rations in a feed store. I will say, however, that again, some complete rations may not give them everything they need. In North Carolina, we had goats on pasture, saw some signs of copper deficiency, even though they were on a pelleted feed and, fo and forages, a grass clover mix pasture, and had a regular loose mineral. When we gave a high copper loose mineral, the copper deficiency symptoms went away. So it may be that we had high iron in the water. We had just hooked up new waters and it was a new location for us. So it's possible, I did not check that, but high iron can actually block copper absorption. 
so we want to balance those out and anyway we want to make sure that we are giving the animals what they need to help fight worms and to avoid any other nutritional issues